welcome everybody to another seminar here in CFT. And today we have the pleasure of having uh, Professor Pavel Kuzinski from the Adam uh, Matskevich University. Mitskevich, sorry. Yes. Yes. My yeah, Polish yeah. is. No, the, it was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> in uh, Poznan. And today he's going to talk about the detection of quantum chaos with quantum Hamming distance. Thank you very much, Professor Pavel, uh, yeah. for accepting our invitation. And the, the screen is yours. No, the, the pleasure is fine. Uh, thank you very much for, for, for this invitation. So I'm, I'm very happy to, to, to present uh, my research here. So actually, uh, uh, I'm going to tell you about the research that I'm doing together with my friends from Poznan. So Andrzej Grudka. Jędrzej Stępin, uh, Janek Wójcik and Ant Antoni Wójcik, and also uh, Adam Saina from, from, from Wrocław. He's from, from Wrocław uh, University of Technology. Uh, so let me just go some some overview. Uh, so, so, so the idea is to talk about detection of uh, quantum chaos. So first, let's say a few words about detection of um, classical key, uh, chaos. So basically, uh, we know very well that uh, the, the basic tool to detect classical chaos is to look at trajectories in phase space. And if we see that they diverge, then basically, and then moreover, if they diverge very fast, like exponentially in time, then we say that the system is, cha is chaotic. I mean, it's an oversimplified uh, description, but more or less, it, that's the idea. And now, uh, how, we, how we basically detect that these trajectories diverge? We basically need to uh, calculate the distance between these trajectories and calculate how it changes in time. And the distance that we are using in this Euclidean space, uh, sorry, in this phase space, is exactly Euclidean distance. On the other hand, uh, when we go to quantum physics, we no longer have uh, a phase space or, or like a standard classical phase space. Uh, and uh, the, the usual distance that we that people use. When, when they consider distance between quantum states is the standard overlap distance, so like fidelity, like Bourish distance, things like that. Now, the, the thing is that when we consider unitary dynamics, so we have like a Hamiltonian chaotic system, when we consider unitary dynamics, the distance does not change in time. Moreover, if you even consider open system dynamics, then usually this distance decreases in time, so, so there is no divergence of trajectories. And this, for, for, for a long time, was believed as a kind of signature that there is no chaos in quantum system. But of course, there is chaos in quantum system, and people developed some different tools to detect quantum chaos. And now the, the idea here is that to try to detect quantum chaos in a similar way that we detect classical chaos. So in other words, to come up with some kind of a distance, different distance, not like a standard overlap distance, between quantum states, that will change uh, during the evolution, will increase and maybe even increase exponentially fast. Okay, so, so these ideas actually are gathered in these two papers. So if you are interested in details, please, please uh, check them. Th these are just two papers in FISREFI. Uh, and okay, so let, let me basically go to uh, uh, some, 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 some overview of, uh, of uh, classical chaos or something that's called classical state sensitivity. This is what I already said, but right now we have this picture. So again, let's say that we have some Hamiltonian system, okay? So it's described by some Hamiltonian. The, the position and momentum evolves according to the standard equations of motion. And, and this is exactly how we detect chaos. We have some initial points, let's call them S, and some another point S prime. Let's, let's say that this point S prime is a perturb, is a, it just came from S, but via some perturbation, so this initial distance is small. But of course, right now, since the system is chaotic, these trajectories will start to diverge in time, and then we can calculate this distance, and we see that it changes. And again, the metric that we use here is the standard Euclidean metric. Now, if we go to quantum systems, uh, we have uh, phase space. Uh, so sorry, we don't have phase space. We have we have we have Wigner functions. We have, so we we don't have in phase space. We do not have single points. Instead, we have probability distribution or even quasi probability distributions. We can have some negative probabilities. Okay. So right now, if we consider some initial preparation, let's let's say this blue preparation, this psi zero, 
Uh, and then let's say some perturb preparation, which will be uh, represented by this re re red region, psi prime, at time zero. There might be some overlap, which is denoted by this region, region alpha. Again, this is kind of like a schematic picture. And during the evolution, uh, of course, each region will change. But there will, th 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 but there will still be some overlap between these two regions. And even the area of this region may change, but what is important, the, the, the total amount of probability contained in this region alpha here and this region alpha here does not change in time. It, it, it's constant. So, so, so the, this is basically kind of like a gra graphical representation of what I said before, that the overlap uh, does not change during the evolution. Okay, so, so this basically shows you that, that overlap is not a very good tool to detect, uh, to detect quantum chaos, but nevertheless, during the evolution of quantum systems, something may happen. Something, so, something chaotic may happen, and we need to look for a proper tool to detect it. Okay, and here, actually, there is a very beautiful, uh, beautiful example, beautiful explanation of why overlap will not work even in classical system. This example was given by Ballantyne and Zibin in this paper here that, that I cite below from Fizrefe. Actually, this is a very beautiful paper, so I highly recommend it. So imagine a very simple situation. So let's say that you have a classical system, classical chaotic system, and consider three different preparations, three different initial states, this red state, the green state, and blue state. And of course, since the system is chaotic, uh, the trajectories, the, the three trajectories will diverge, okay? But right now, imagine that there is some uncertainty in, uh, in, in our preparation. So we do not, we, we cannot prepare exactly a single point. Let's say that we, we prepare one of two points. So let's say that the first preparation will be like that. We prepare this red point with probability one half and this green point also with probability one half. And of course, this region, each point within this preparation evolves according to their own trajectory. So of course, the region may spread. Now, if you consider the second preparation, this blue one, you can have this, uh, right now, the, the, the blue preparation, this blue point with probability one half, and green point with probability one half. So we see that in both preparations, this green point is shared. So this is the overlap. And again, this blue region may evolve, but still it will share this green point together with this red, um, with this red preparation. So, so, so again, in each preparation, the probability of a green point is one half, and this, and this does not change in time. So, so Obviously, even in classical system, overlap is not a good measure of, uh, of, some, of something chaotic going on. So because of, of this, people invented many different tools to study quantum chaos. So I think everything started with, with uh, um, uh, analyzing statistics of energy levels and eigenstates of Hamiltonian. So basically, uh, it was quite early noticed that the spectra of chaotic Hamiltonians should behave like spectra of random matrices. So, so random matrix theory became very important for, 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 for people studying quantum chaos. Another very interesting idea was proposed by Asher Peres. So, so this is this, uh, instead of perturbing states, let's perturb Hamiltonians. So we, we can have some Hamiltonian uh, and let's say that, that there is some parameter lambda inside this Hamiltonian. So we basically vary this parameter lambda a little bit and we check how much the, the, the evolution uh, changes. That's one thing. Another thing also very interesting and it's related to, to so-called OTOX, out of time order correlators that, 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 that are re recently studied, is this Loschmidt echo. So basically what, what you do, you, mm, uh, you can take your system, you can evolve it forward in time, then you can disturb it a little bit and then you evolve it backwards in time and you see how much this initial state differs from evolved forward in time state perturbed and evolved backward in time okay next thing and actually i'm going to oh, hello, can it. i have a question now already now yes sure uh, so concerning this hamiltonian perturbation approach by by, by Perez. yes so you perturb the hamiltonian then you well, get a, another unitary and then you compare the, the initial unitary with the per perturbed one, or? Yeah, yes, as, as I remember, it's, 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 let's say you take some state psi zero, 
you you have your Hamiltonian with your parameter lambda, uh, okay? okay. Uh -huh. You evolve it in time, let's say for, for some fixed period of time, delta yes. t, uh -huh. and then you change this lambda into lambda plus some epsilon. So you have different uh -huh. Hamiltonian, and then you evolve it again by this uh, time delta, and uh -huh. then you see what's what's happening. Uh, but in the end, you, you compare the states by by the fidelity or by that, like... and and then you, you you can use fidelity. I mean, in Loschmidecho, they also use use fidelity. Okay. 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 Thank you. No problem. So, but by the way, if you have some some questions during the talk, please please interrupt me. I'll I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, I mean, or, or try to answer them. Okay. The next thing, and I and I already said that I'm I, I will relate to it is the entanglement dynamics. So actually, people notice that. Uh, if we take many body systems uh, that are chaotic, uh, in such system, entanglement between the, between the parts grows rapidly. I mean, the systems get entangled very fast. Actually, the, the, if we have, for example, n, n parts, then the entanglement grows like logarithm of n. This is basically the, the time after which the system gets um, like maximally entangled. Okay, and there are many, many, many other measures of, uh, of, of, of quantum chaos. But as you can see, none of these, these measures, no, none of these methods resembles the standard approach with this distance uh, that, that's used in classical theory, that, that's used to, 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 to detect this classical hypersensitivity. And actually, there is one additional thing, and this is actually a crucial part here. Uh, there is one additional problem with overlap distance, namely, the overlap distance uh, detects some kind of like differences between superposition, but it does not detect some f differences which are important from the physical point of view. Namely, consider these three states, Psi 1, Psi 2, and Psi 3. Imagine that there are, I mean, there are like um, n qubit states. So right now assume that n is like Avogadro number, okay, 10 to the power 23. Let's think that these qubits are spins, okay? So the first state, Psi 1, represents a system of all spins pointing down, uh, let's say, along the axis, okay? So, I mean, this is a system which, which has a very well-defined physical property that the, the magnetization is, is, is well-defined. All spins are pointing down. And then consider state Psi 2. One spin uh, is flipped, okay? So, so then, basically, for, of course, from the point of view of, of mathematics, Psi 1 and Psi 2 are orthogonal, right? So, so, so the distance between them is already, like the overlap distance between them is already maximum. But from the physical point of view, basically this is like a microscopic, sorry, uh, uh, yeah, microscopic perturbation. So, 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 I mean, using macroscopic um, tools, it would be probably very hard to detect any difference in magnetization between Psi 1 and Psi 2. But right now look at Psi 3. This is another state in which all spins are right now pointing up, okay? So we have all ones, all 10 to the 23 spins, right, are, are pointing up. So again, mathematically, Psi 1 is orthogonal to Psi 2, is orthogonal to Psi 3, and Psi 2 and Psi 3 are orthogonal. So overlap distance between them is maximal, that they, they kind of like span triangle. But from the physical point of view, Psi 3 differs macroscopically from, from Psi 1 and Psi 2. So, so, so again, if you use an overlap distance, you would see that the, 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 the distance between Psi 1 and Psi 2 and Psi 1 and Psi 3 is the same. It would be like pi over 2. But we are looking for some different kind of distance that would be of the order 1 when it comes to, the, to comparing Psi 1 and Psi 2, but would be of the order n, so the, 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 the number of particles, when comparing Psi 1 and Psi 3. And this is actually already, you, you, you feel that, that we are going towards this idea of humming distance. So such a thing was proposed. It was a beautiful idea by Girolami and Anza. Uh, they published a paper in 2021. They introduced something called whited Burish length. Uh, in, but, but in fact, this is, this is exactly the quantum humming distance. So, so that's why right now we, 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 we refer to it quantum humming distance because we believe that this name is much more intuitive. And again, this, uh, this is the definition. And, and when you first look at it, it looks, uh, well, kind of complicated. So maybe before I discuss it, let me go to this slide. I'll give you some intuition and then I go back to the definition. So basically imagine that you have uh, a system that consists of n parts, 
So basically, this distance is, is, is to be applied to multipartite systems. You can think of qubits, but actually, these, these elementary parts do not need to be qubits, okay? So imagine that you have this n-partite system, and it can be prepared in two different states, rho n or sigma n. So this rho n will be denoted by this, by this blue dots, each dot corresponding to a different subsystem, or sigma n. And then what you do, of course, if you were to calculate like a standard fidelity, which is basically overlap distance, then you will calculate the fidelity between rho n and sigma n. And this does not change under unitary dynamics. Now, their idea is the following. What you do first, you divide your system, you introduce some partition of your system. And of course, there are many possible partitions. So in fact, what they do, they consider all possible partitions and they maximize over, over all this partition. And what is maximized? So, so I'm going to talk about it right now. So this is an example partition. So for example, we divide it into four parts. The, the fourth part consists only of one element, the third part of one element. The second part consists of two elements, and the first part consists of three elements. And each part right now is described by, by the corresponding reduced density matrix. In this case, it's, in, the, in the case of the first preparation, it's row one, row two, row three, and row four. And in case of the second preparation, it's sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, and sigma four. And right now what you do, you calculate the distance between the partitions. So you calculate the distance between row one and sigma one. And actually you can use any distance. They, they, they used um, this standard Boorish distance, so they use fidelity. But you can, use, you can use something else. Okay, so you calculate this distance here row, between row one and sigma one. You calculate another distance between row two and sigma two. Same for row three, sigma three, uh, row four, sigma four, and so on. Okay, so you consider all possible partitions, you consider all possible distances, and then what you do, I just come back right now, you sum up all these distances over all parts, and moreover, you, you, you weight them. This is this weighting factor, where K alpha is basically the number of elements in a partition. So for example, the weight for this part partition will be one over three, here will be one over two, and here the weight is one. So actually this weight is introduced so that everything behaves nicely, but what is important, once you do it, this obeys all the properties of a metric, okay? And then basically you calculate the sum, given some partition, P, and you do it for all possible partitions and you choose the maximum. And this is basically th this definition. So as this distance, you can use... Oh, can I have a question here? Because yes, I, of course. So, like, so, uh, so you take row n, but row n might, might be correlated, right? And then you trace the, you take the reduced density matrices, right, for the for the distance. Exactly. But that does yeah. really reflect the, you know, I mean, it's like you lose a lot of properties of the state, no? If you like take the reduced. Yes, indeed. By basically by uh, um, considering this partition, you lose you lose information about uh, entanglement between these partitions. Yeah, exactly. That's true. Yes, but yes, that's true. That's true. I mean, again. This is this is some property. Like like for example, if you if you calculate the standard overlap distance, you also do not, uh, you know, the standard overlap distance uncovers, uh, gives you information about something, but not about everything. So so yeah, this yeah, is yeah. similar thing here. You yeah. get information about something, but you lose information about something else. But mm -hmm. but yeah, th that's true. And again, the hope is that okay, we may lose something, but we may get some other information, and we hope that in this uh, this information that we get, there'll be some information about chaotic behavior. Uh, okay, but, but then again, as I said, so you can use arbitrary distances. Any distance you use will obey the, 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 the metric properties, okay? So, so this, is, this is a proper metric, okay? And now the idea is... Can I ask, can I ask a question? Yes, yeah, sure. So you, uh, you distinguish different, uh, uh, different uh, space by your physical physical interpretation. But mathematically, there is no actually, there's no way to actually distinguish I mean, low one and some other part of a density matrix. So, okay, again, as I said, if I understand you correctly, uh, you're asking whether, you know, I may have some, some, some uh, general state row and then I partite it in some arbitrary way. No, it's not like that. Uh, 
I really need to have an apartheid system. So I, I, I need to have some physical uh, physical partition into, into n different cu qubits, for example, into n different spins and different physical systems. So this, this partition that I'm introducing here, I mean, it's uh, physically oriented. It's physically motivated. So in the same, uh, the partition, uh, the part, uh, uh, the system with the same dimension also can be distinguished uh, in your uh, preparation or you? I mean, so uh, for, for example, let's, uh, let's say that, okay, I will have a simple system, let's say con consisting of three qubits, okay? So it's eight dimensional Hubert space. So I have natural partitions. I can have either trivial partitions, so, uh, so, so, so like a one, part, one partition with three part particles, or like partition one particle versus two particles, or, 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 or partition into the three different parts, each containing single qubit, okay? But again, this is eight dimensional space. And then, and then let's say that I take another system in which I do not have any partition, but in which I, which, which simply has a Hilbert space, which is eight dimensional. And then you're asking whether I can use the same tools to, 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 to calculate distances for this system. Am I correct? Do I understand right. you correctly? Yeah, so I would say, in principle, you can, but this would be something like artificial in the sense that, I mean, perhaps you, you, would, you would uncover some mathematical properties, but, but, but I don't see how some, some physical information would, would, would be there. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. But, but I'll, I'll be happy to discuss uh, okay. this issue later. Okay, and now, uh, you see that this formula actually is quite complicated. So you can imagine that it's not easy to calculate it for an arbitrary quantum state. But in their paper, Girolami and Anza managed to provide some nice formulas for this, uh, for this distance for some particular classes of states. So for example, let's come back to, this, to these examples that I considered uh, earlier. So let's consider the state Psi1 of all n spins pointing down on all n qubits being zero. And then let's consider a superposition of this state with this with similar state after this microscopic flip. So only one spin is flipped, okay? So, so th this is like a general uh, superposition between two such terms, it's Psi2. And then Psi3 is another superposition with similar coefficients. I mean, with, with the same coefficient, co cosine alpha and sine alpha. But this time, this, this other state in the superposition is, is the state in which all spins are flipped. So actually, the state Psi2 is still a product state, whereas the state Psi3 is a huge GHZ state, huge uh, maximally entangled state. And then if we consider overlap, the, then the distance between Psi1 and Psi2 would be just uh, alpha. Okay, and, the, and, and to, if you consider standard overlap, the distance between Psi 1 and Psi 3 would also be alpha. But right now, if you use, uh, if you use the distance defined by Girolami and Anza, then you will find that the distance indeed between Psi 1 and Psi 2 is alpha, but the distance between Psi 1 and Psi 3 is n times alpha. On the other hand, the distance between Psi 2 and Psi 3 is n minus 1 alpha. Uh, so, so, so this is exactly this property that, that we wanted. And, and, and this really reflects the, the similarity to the, to the humming distance. Okay, so once I learned about it, I thought that, okay, maybe, maybe let's try to use uh, this distance introduced by Girolami and Anza. And let's, and let's try to check whether this distance can, de can detect some sensitivity, some quantum chaos. So first I started with, with a kind of like abstract system. This is the so-called Rule 54 uh, system. It's a, it's a kind of like a cellular automaton for uh, qubits, uh, and and it's actually it's 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 quite popular and it's been popular already for some time because people in statistical physics found that the system is interesting due to many reasons and and, and were extensively studying the system. The idea is the following. So imagine that you have set of n qubits. I mean, for simplicity, let's uh, let's assume that. Uh, n is an even number. So what you do, you divide the system into two parts. Uh, for example, if, it's a, if you uh, organize them in a chain, you can divide them into uh, qubits at even position and qubits at odd position. And then the evolution is like a two-step evolution. 
in uh, even uh, steps. Basically, one group of qubits controls the other groups of qubits, and in odd states, this other group controls the first group. And what is the control? So basically, for each spin from one group, we, de we, we define two neighbors from the other group. So again, if we have this chain topology, basically the neighbors are the qubit on the left and the qubit on the right. So here you have this clear division into this red and blue, uh, blue, uh, blue qubits, okay? And basically what you do, the, the, the evolution rule is the following. You flip the state of your qubit if at least one of your neighbors is in a state one. If both of your neighbors are in the state zero, you don't flip it. You, you don't flip your QB. That's it. So basically, you have this unitary op uh, operator here, and then you define a unitary operator for for the control by even states, even qubits, and then another unitary operator in which you control, um, in, in which the control is done by the odd qubits, and then you just alternate these two operators. Okay, so. What I did, I actually um, considered two cases. In the first case, I considered graphs, the, the networks of qubits, in which the neighborhood relation is, is uh, basically introduced in a very regular way. Just, just, so, so, so basically it's a cycle, just like you see in this, in this left picture here. In the second case, basically it was a random graph, so the neighborhood relation was chosen randomly. Okay, and, and then I applied these rules, this, this rule 54, and I was wondering what kind of evolution can, um, can occur um, more, more precisely. What I, what I did was the following thing. So initially I prepared a random uh, state of n qubit in a classical basis. Okay, so, so, so the state was, 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 was classical. It was just a bit string of zeros and ones, but the random one. And then I introduced a perturbation. So basically, you randomly choose one qubit from this whole set, and you perturb it in such a way that you simply rotate it by some angle alpha. Okay, so, so, so zero goes into superposition of cosine zero plus sine one, and one goes into superposition of sine zero minus cosine one. And then basically, uh, th this is the perturbed state. So then basically, I was evolving the system for t time for, for t steps, and then I was calculating the, the this uh, this distance uh, between uh, this unperturbed state and perturbed state, and uh, I was looking how basically this distance changes in time. So you see that because of this perturbation, basically initially we had a product product state of all qubits, but then the interaction was generating a, a GHZ state, and this GHZ state was becoming larger and larger and larger, basically the GHZ state over a bigger set of qubits, okay? And, and, and because Girolami and Anza already found this nice formula for GHZ states, I was able to, to express it analytically. So basically I was looking for this number, I, I, I was looking how, to, how this number kt changes in time, where kt is basically the number of qubits which were affected by this perturbation, okay? Affected in such a way that they were building bigger and bigger GHZ state. So in case... Can I have this, a question, quick question yes? too? So like, is it this, that this, this case is the entanglement depth or something? I mean, because it sounds like this, no? Excuse me, could you repeat? Uh, so is this K uh, the entanglement depth of that, of that state? And uh, I'm, so, so I, I don't know what's exactly entanglement, entanglement depth. Entanglement but... depth is the, is, the, uh, is the largest amount of particles that are in a genuinely entangled state in a given n partite state, let's say. Okay, yep. Yeah. So in this case, that would be it, right? But does, does this rule generalize somehow to, to mixed states and so on? You don't know probably, no? But uh, I, well, maybe I there know. is some relation. As, as I said, I mean, the, the, the problem here was that this distance was calculated for specific examples mm -hmm. of pure yeah, state. Yeah, sure. okay. And then, uh, I mean, in a moment, I'm going to tell you about the, 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 the second stage of our uh, research, where we were indeed considering more general states, still mm -hmm. pure, and we needed to um, do some approximations in, all, in order to evaluate mm -hmm. this distance. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, so basically for a regular gra graph, so let me just come back. For, for, for the graph in this uh, figure A, 
you could observe the following behavior. So here, the total number of qubits was 1,000. And what you can see is that this distance grows um, linearly in time until basically after time approximates to the number of or, or to the half, half of, the, of the number of qubits in the system, it starts to saturate. Uh, and then, if, if actually, if you follow the evolution for, for, for much longer time, you will see that after some time, it will drop down to zero again, because actually this, this evolution, this unitary operator, is periodic, but the period is huge of this unitary operator. Okay, uh, but, but the, what is the re reason for the saturation? So in fact, what, what, uh, the, this K actually measures um, humming distance, and then when you consider a humming distance between uh, uh, two random bit strings of the length n, the average humming distance is uh, of the size uh, uh, n by two, n half. Okay, and this is basically the reason why well, the reason why it saturates at at 500 because again the total number of qubits in this example was um, 1,000. Now this, these are the results for for the random graph. Uh, so. What I did, I considered a few cases. The, 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 the smallest plot, I mean the, the, the one at the bottom, uh, this navy blue one, corresponds to the case uh, of, uh, here it was like 100 qubits. Then the orange one corresponds to 200 qubits. The green one corresponds to 500 qubits. Then the red one corresponds to something like 1,000. And then the, the purple one corresponds to 2,000 qubits. So what you see? Is that look look at time here you see the huge exponential growth actually of this distance and then of course there is saturation due to, due to the same reasons as I discussed a moment ago so basically th this was kind of like a proof of principle that you can have quantum systems perhaps artificial because this rule 54 is I mean it's I, I don't know if you can realize it in laboratory perhaps some people tried but definitely it's not it's not not a natural system okay uh, but, but, but definitely, right now we have a proof of principle that you may have some quantum system evolving unitarily uh, f uh, for which you can see this exponential separation of, 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 of uh, exponential sensitivity to perturbation. Okay? So basically the next step was to consider something more, more physical. So what we did, we consider quantum kicktop. This is, I would say, like a typical, like a canonical uh, quantum chaotic model. Actually, kicktop is also like a classical model. It, it represents like a s single angular momentum that evolves in time in like a two steps. We have like a standard rotation about y-axis, and then we have a nonlinear rotation about z-axis. This nonlinear rotation is basically uh, realized in the following way, depending on what is z-projection uh, I mean, what is the component of your angular momentum? You rotate, uh, you rotate uh, your 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 spin, your your angular momentum about the z-axis, uh, about the different angles. So basically, the the projection onto z-axis defines the angle of rotation. So this is the the uh, nonlinearity. Now, uh, if we go to a quantum case. We can think of some spin S uh, system, but we also know that spin S can be represented by uh, S uh, two times S spins one half. Okay, so, uh, so 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 instead of speaking of a single single spin, large spin, we can speak of many spin one half systems. And basically, this multi spin one half system is what people usually consider when they talk of uh, when, when they speak uh, about quantum kicktop. So again, this system was uh, work, maybe first let me let me describe the system. So we have this n qubit system. And there are two different stages of evolution. Each stage is unitary. The first stage described by the operator u one is just the rotation of each qubit by the same angle alpha about y-axis. Okay, so this is this is this first stage, kind of like a simple uh, simple evolution. And the second one corresponding to this nonlinear rotation is 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 the following. We just allow to interact 
uh, for the interaction between each qubit pair. And this interaction is just like the standard Ising interaction, so it's ZZ, ZZ interaction. And we assume that all, all qubits interact with the same strength, and the strength is given here by this parameter beta normalized by the number of qubits. Okay, so you see that you have a two-parameter system, actually, alpha and beta. But uh, you can s even simplify the dynamics by choosing alpha to be equal to pi half. This, 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 this nicely simplifies this rotation about, about y-axis. And then we have a single parameter system. And already in the single parameter systems, people manage to show both. In, f f first, in classical case, that if we vary this parameter beta, we can go from a regular behavior. And by regular, I mean that this uh, spin, this angular momentum, orbits some nice, nice, um, I mean, follows some nice loop. Or we can go to, to chaotic regime if, if beta is, is uh, large enough. So basically this, we know that if beta is less than one, then we are definitely in this regular regime. If beta is greater than, than three, we are in the chaotic regime. Okay, and then the people knew it in classical case. People studied quantum case. Excuse me, and what yes? is between, between one and three? Okay, between one and three, there is a very interesting region like a transition region. So depending on initial conditions, depending on the initial state where you start, you can either follow the regular trajectory or you can follow some chaotic trajectory. Actually, I'm going to, to speak also about this region in a moment so you will see some picture okay. that, will, that, that will represent what, what, what can happen. Sometimes people refer to this, we can have chaotic system, but there, are, there is something called islands of regularity. So, so there might be some initial conditions which will still behave regularly. Uh, yeah, so, 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 so again, people considered this system classically and, and, and they found exactly this scaling of beta. And then uh, people also consider quantum, quantum cases and we're studying it using plenty of these different tools to study quantum chaos that I mentioned in the beginning of my talk. And they confirmed that Indeed, uh, the system also behaves quantum cha chaotically if beta is greater than three. So, so there was this nice correspondence between classical behavior, classical chaotic behavior and uh, quantum chaotic behavior. And what we wanted to do, we wanted to apply our method based on this um, quantum humming distance to check whether it will also capture this uh, chaotic behavior. Okay, so Again, as I said before, the problem is that uh, right now, uh, during, due to this evolution, the system will not generate like nice GHZ states. This, the, 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 the states that will be generated during the evolution are quite complicated. So um, we do not have a nice formula for, for this um, uh, humming distance, uh, for, for this quantum humming distance. But what we can do, we can bound it from below. We can basically fix some partition and then calculate this distance according to this partition. And then what we know that, okay, maybe this partition does not maximize this distance, but definitely if, if we see that for this choice of partition, we will observe an exponential growth. Since it's a lower bound, then of course uh, the, uh, the, this proper distance, which, which is maximized, Will, will need to grow at least exponentially. So what we did, we, we, we made a very simple choice. We consider a partition in which each part consists of a single qubit. So we divided the n qubit system into n parts. So we basically calculated this distances between each qubit and uh, summed all these distances. And the distance that we used was the standard trace distance here. So that was the, the, the basically the procedure that we followed. I mean, Maybe one, one, one additional comment. We managed to actually uh, calculate it for a huge number of qubits simply because we use the fact that the whole dynamics here is symmetric. In a sense, it, if we start in a symmetric subspace, it will not go, go outside of the symmetric subspace. And normally when we have n qubits, the dimension of, the, uh, of our system scales as two to the power n. But if we have a symmetric subspace, symmetric subspace scales linearly with n, which is, which is nice, and then we could even consider huge matrices, uh, and it's just, it's just, we were still capable of, 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 of uh, handling them numerically. Uh, so 
the idea is the following. Initially, we prepared our system in a product state, in a product symmetric state. So each qubit was in a pure state pointing along some random direction uh, defined by this theta and phi, and all qubits were in the same state. Then the preparation of, of the perturbed state was the following. We took this, this state here, psi zero, and we rotated about some randomly chosen axis by some tiny angle phi, okay? And then basically what we did, we evolved this state psi zero into psi t, psi zero prime into psi t prime using this evolution operators of a quantum kicktop. And basically then uh, what we did, we calculated this distance. Then we also, uh, because we, we got some, some, some kind of like not, not nice curves, they were, there were some peaks, some oscillations. So in order to get rid of the oscillations, we, we just averaged it over, over different choices of initial states. And then we obtained this parameter dt. And these are the results that, 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 we, that we obtained. But by the way, sorry, I just wanted to ask, you mentioned that at some point we may need to stop it and enter once more the presentation. Do we still have time? No, we still have time. Okay, yes, you, you can continue because okay. so far I don't have any notifications. Thank okay, you. because because uh, I, I'm almost done. Okay, so so the first observation was the following. The, here are the plots for the following case. Uh, the number of qubits was one one thousand. Okay, uh, the uh, perturbation, so the rotation of the initial state into this perturbed state was was done by the angle zero point zero one. Okay, and then you have two plots. The blue plot corresponds to this regular uh, regime, so beta is equal to one, and the other one corresponds to chaotic regime, which we decided to choose like a larger beta uh, equal to six. And then what you see is the following. The, in case of um, uh, chaotic regime, this uh, average quantum humming distance grows r rapidly, and then after it stays there just for a quick moment, and then it rapidly decreases, okay? Uh, I will explain in a moment what is the reason. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the distance, uh, the quantum hamming distance for the regular case grows much, much slower. So already, I mean, you have here a qualitative uh, distinction between regular and chaotic behavior, so, so already you have, a, you have a kind of like a witness. Uh, of, a, of, 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 a, of a chaoticity. Now, what is the reason for the drop of this distance? You need to remember, as I told you, maybe I go back, that we decided to choose a specific partition in which each part consists of a single qubit, okay? So initially, each qubit is in a pure state. And then, the, in the first preparation, these qubits uh, are I mean, have one pure state. In another preparation, they have a different pure state, but, but these states are very similar. And then they evolve. So from the point of view of individual qubits, these two states, of course, start to separate. But at the same time, because these qubits interact, they strongly interact, they become entangled. So they, they're, they're basically uh, block vectors start to shrink down. So the block vectors start to separate, but at the same time, they start to shrink down. And after, once the system gets entangled, the blow vectors drop down to zero, the length of blow vectors drop down to zero, and basically a single qubit density matrices become maximally mixed, and, or almost maximally mixed, and, and, and therefore the distance between two such uh, states is, 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 is zero or is very small, and this is basically the drop of this distance. The, the drop of this distance basically uh, is a signature that, that the system gets entangled. And in order to confirm it, what I show in this right plot is the linear entropy, which is, which is defined like that. And th th this, is, this is basically the, uh, the, the purity of a single qubit. It, it tells you what, what is the entanglement of a single qubit against the rest of the system, okay? Uh, and then you can see that this linear entropy grows very fast and then it saturates because, because then the, the disentanglement is maximized, okay? And the saturation time exactly corresponds to the position of this peak. And, and for example, here in this um, uh, non-chaotic non regular regime, you see that entanglement grows much, much slower. Then, then, then the next thing, as I told you, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, People look at the entanglement time 
uh, in chaotic systems and basically the time of entanglement uh, is, 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 some, is, is ref compared to the RNFS time. RNFS time is, is uh, uh, roughly speaking the time after which correspondence principle fails. So in simple language I would say we know that uh, if we have uh, uh, some quantum state in a phase space, if the wave packet is, is narrow, then we can uh, interpret, I mean, we can say that this position of this wave packet, packet more or less uh, represents uh, the particle. But then the wave packet uh, gets more and more random. I mean, the, the uncertainties grow and the system starts to spread over a whole uh, Hilbert space. And then basically this approximation cannot be used anymore. And, and the moment when this approximation phase is exactly the Ehrenfest time. Now, when the system gets entangled, the uncertainty, uncertainties grow, grow and, and, and exactly once the uncertainties grow, you just reach this, uh, the, this limit when you cannot use this correspondence principle. And, and, and this is basically this rough comparison between entanglement time and Ehrenfest time. So, okay, uh, long story short, people said that in, in chaotic system, Ehrenfest time should scale as logarithm of n. And because of that, people said, okay, uh, so the, the time after which the system gets strongly entangled should scale also as logarithm of n. So we compare it here. Uh, we used our distance and as, as, already I, as I already said, the position of the peak should correspond to the moment of the, uh, when the system gets strongly entangled. And the position of the peak really scales as logarithm of n. Here you have different, different numbers of, um, of n. Okay, whereas in a, in a regular regime, so this is in this right figure, this, uh, the position of this scales as square root of n, okay? And finally, and here we, we come back to this interesting region, this intermediate region between, which is neither fully chaotic, neither fully uh, regular. You can, have, you can have, as I said, both classical, uh, both regular and chaotic trajectories. So first look, at this uh, at, um, at this right uh, figure, so so this is uh, from the classical uh, kick top evolution. You can have uh, for this beta, you can have two preparation. If your initial state is chosen like that, then it will follow this nice trajectory, this nice blue trajectory. But if you choose your initial state like that here on this on in this in this place then it will follow this chaotic uh, trajectory which is which is marked by this red red region okay and now what we did we basically took exactly beta equal to 2.3 and then uh, we considered uh, these uh, the, the the corresponding initial states for the quantum system and we were uh, analyzing how the distance between this state and slightly perturbed state changes in time. So actually in this blue case, you see that it does not change much. Whereas in this red case, you see that it starts to jump and, and grow much faster. So, so actually you can see that this, this tool, this quantum Hamic distance can also be used to distinguish between classical, uh, sorry, regular and chaotic trajectories in this intermediate regions. All right. So, that's basically all I, that I wanted to say, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Pavel. Now we have time for questions. Thank you. Well, so I can start, I guess. Uh, so concerning what you showed on the, the previous slide, like where you had this, this uh, peak on the mm -hmm. plot of the... the sorry, I right now uh, if, 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 uh, exit from the full screen. Uh, uh, okay, okay. Can, can you still see my presentation? Yes. Yes, we can. Great. So can you go back to the slide number 19? All right. So here it's like the... So you observe this peak because we start from a, a pure separable state, right? I mean, like it's a product of pure state. Yes. And then you get uh, you take another, which is very close to the to the initial one, and then you, you see that the you know the evolution makes the, the states diverge. But uh, what happens if you start from an entangled state and you perturb it slightly, and then you apply the evolution? I would say that the well there will be no such peak, right? Because uh, the... yes, I believe so. That in this case there'll be no such peak, but then 
uh, still, I believe that uh, this quantum Hamming distance uh, should work, but this time you should you, you, you should use a different partition. Again, uh, we observe this peak mm -hmm. because we chose a specific partition, and because of this choice, we are not evaluating yes. the exact Hamming the, the quantum Hamming distance, but we are evaluating a lower bound on it. But what what if like the evolution is such that it keeps the state? Uh... So you know that there are these uh, absolutely maximally entangled states, mm -hmm. states that you, you know trace out uh, half of it, then you get the maximally mixed state. So I guess that for this state, for any partition, you always uh, have the maximally mixed state. And imagine that you have a s evolution that keeps the state uh, to be almost absolutely maximally entangled. Then you wouldn't be able to to observe this this peak, no? For any for, for any uh, for any partition. Yeah. Uh, that's a that, that that's a, that, that's an interesting problem. But tell me, because I know that these ups, uh, the, the, these AMES states, right? The, 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 these AMES states are, are are quite interesting, but also not easy to to obtain, right? I mean, do you know some natural Hamiltonians or natural evolutions that will generate such states? Okay, this thing I don't know actually, but well, I, I know that there are some examples of such states. Mm -hmm. And uh, but like my question is like about about the possibility of observing this this peak or this, mm -hmm. this chaos, let's say, because like here you kind of started from a specific state, then you observe the, the peak. But like, what happens if you don't observe it? Like in this case, so what I mean, like so my example was to 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 mm -hmm. somehow show that it's not always possible to observe this kind of effect. And then, yeah, I, I agree. So in this case, perhaps you may. Wrongly assume that there is no chaos in your system, right? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, what would you say? I mean, like you, you do it, and I mean, okay. So, what I would try would be the following thing. So, let's say I choose some partition, and I will do my my my, my experiment, mm -hmm. and then I do not observe peak. So yes. then, what I do, I would choose like a different partition. And basically, <laughs> I will. Then, okay. then basically, it would be a very tedious and and definitely non non efficient uh, way mm -hmm. of of. Uh, Trying to achieve, let me go back. Uh, trying to achieve this maximization here. <laughs> but but is there any way of like so? Do, do you know any uh, evolution which is not cha chaotic in terms of this distance, but it it is in terms of some other uh, measures? Uh, that, that's a good thing. I, I I don't know because still it's it's a it's a um, quite a new thing that we are doing. Yeah, okay. But but. Uh, you know, we we are quite hopeful that, that we can detect many things with it, but 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 of course, mm -hmm. I'm 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 suspecting that it's not that perfect tool, right? But so, no, I, but, no. but, I mean, if I if I may say just just to advertise what we are doing here in Poznan, right now we we are also trying to apply this method to detect quantum chaos in a very few qubit systems, like for example, uh, Yannick and Yenj are right now trying to do some simulations even in two qubit systems. Because I mean, it would be really uh, hard to say that in a qubit systems we have some chaos, mm -hmm. but maybe at least we can have a signature, some kind of like an onset of chaotic behavior. So, so this is, and and actually, f f first results that they obtained are quite promising. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Next question, please. Okay. Yes. Victor, we barely hear you. Moment out oh, now, yeah. perfect. Ah, uh, now it's okay. Okay, <clears throat> listen. In in classical physics, when you consider um, this chaotic behavior, the uh, uh, phase space is large. So if you if you can, can consider even two particles, they have lots of space. They are exponentially diverging. Distance between them. The exponentially diverging. Now, in your case, you consider system which consists of each each part consists only of two states, up and down. Then you cannot consider just two two um, qubits because the space is very small. They cannot diverge. But imagine that instead of qubits, you consider spin large spins. Okay. Large spins. Then the the number of different state is large, and in principle, uh, you may find exponential uh, increase of of the distance just in, in let's say between uh, spin of the first uh, 
uh, cubic uh, particle and spin of uh, another. And I imagine that the spin is large. Then you can you then reproduce results of uh, classical physics. Then you don't need to consider the how to say you consider the <clears throat> uh state of the total system but in classical physics you consider mm -hmm. just two up uh, two particles or two points in your uh, uh phase space so um when when you de uh developing the chaotic behavior in quantum system it looks very different from what is in in classic in classic is just two neighbor particles they are diverging not I mean, their trajectory is diverging and in this case two qubits they don't have so say space to diverge oh okay so i mean here may, maybe I, I will answer in that way so uh, there was actually a very very nice uh, approach to 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 chaos that was uh, that originates from from uh, boris chirikov uh he was studying chaos uh, also in like uh, classical discrete systems. And then he said that, uh, okay, in general, chaos is usually studied in continuous system. But when you consider uh, chaos uh, in, in and, and chaos is like kind of like a continuous property. But then when you consider chaos in discrete systems, and I mean the, 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 the in discrete space space, right? Mm. Uh, then um, basically, well, you don't have the, the, the discontinuities and then, okay, you you will not call, call it chaos, but then you are looking for some interesting dynamics, and then he noticed that actually this is the same thing that people from random number generators are doing. What they do is basically they take a system of bits, of classical bits, mm. and again, finite system of bits, uh, and then they look for some kind of uh, evolution, some, some kind of function that will change them, in such a way that it would be very hard to trace the, the the origin of this of this transformation, right? And and this this is what they called uh, pseudo pseudo randomness. That, that that's the idea be, behind pseudo random generators, right? And then he said that basically these people do exactly the same thing as people in chaos theory, but right now if you go to to basically finite uh, finite level systems, then instead of chaos you have pseudo chaos. Uh, and then for example the I know what I'm saying is a bit long, but I, I think there is a very interesting uh, set of, of, of papers. So, so the next thing, look at, I think, the simplest example of classical chaos, namely a logistics map. It's a, it's a chaos defined only on a very uh, short, uh, short interval, x from 0 to 1, right? Mm. But, but it's but, periodic. Sorry? But it's a recursive relation, so you come all the time, the same space, many times. No, well, well I mean, if, if it's continuous, the standard, I mean, logistics map, if you have standard logistics map, then, of course, then it's not periodic. And then, um, then, the, 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 then you have a chaotic behavior in this map. But then there was a very nice paper, I think, in around 2000 by some people who are, who are actually engineers. They'd consider... Uh, a realization of a logistics map on a finite amount of bits. So let's say that you re, you re, re, basically what, what you have you you have number x, which is a real number between zero and one. You can always write it as a as a, as a fraction in binary numbers, which is 0 0.01 so on. And then basically this this binary extension is what is encoded on this n qubit. And of course, since it's a real number, you would need infinite number of infinite number of bits to encode it. But we just truncate it. Then the system will be uh, there'll be a recurrence relation. So so the system will be uh, will will be periodic, cyclic. But the period is so large mm -hmm. that we, from the point of view of like times yeah. that are interesting to us, the system behaves in a definitely interesting interesting way. Uh, in fact, look, when, when we are simulating chaos in, on our computers, we are doing this using uh, bits, standard bits, right? So we are simulating it using a finite system. So, so in, in a sense, we do not have full chaos, but we at least see some signatures of some interesting behaviors. So right now, again, to make a long story short, the whole idea would be 
even if we even if we have few qubit, qubit systems, of course there'll be no true chaos there. But what will be there, perhaps, is some interesting signatures of some behaviors that may become chaotic in, in, in yeah, case yeah. When, when, when the number of qubits starts to grow. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> okay thank you, Victor. Uh, another questions? So maybe I would have one more. Is it okay, Alexandra? Yeah. <laughs> So, yes, yes, okay. Is, is there, so like, it seems that this this uh, kicked top is like an entangling uh, unitary evolution, right? And it produces entanglement in the end. Yes. So the obvious question is whether there is a relation between the, you know, this the, the distance, the Hamming, quantum Hamming distance, and uh, the power of uh, of uh, the entangling gate. I mean, in terms of like how much entanglement it can create. Yes, I would say definitely, definitely, because like, like for example, here, look, um, in this, uh, in this, uh, in this case, this area case that I studied, mm -hmm. when you have like a regular graph, the entanglement grows basically like on a line, neighbor by neighbor. If you have like, like, like uh, this um, chaotic graph, the, the entanglement can grow exponentially fast. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, because like one one qubit in a superposition will create two qubits in a superposition in a, in a joint superposition, so in an entangled state. Then these two qubits will affect another f another two neighbors, so in total four qubits, mm -hmm. which will affect a, you know exponential growth. Uh, and on the line, you can just affect one neighbor on the right and one neighbor on the left. So you have, and then uh, for example here in this um, kick top, look everything happens because. You have here interaction between, uh, it's, it's not like a nearest neighbor interaction, it's like everybody with everybody, mm -hmm. right? So that's why this, 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 this creates uh, entanglement and very fast. Yes, but uh, I meant like more uh, qualitative uh, relations, like in terms of measures, you know, some functions, no? Like characterizing entanglement and the, and the, the quantum Hamming distance. So, have you tried to, to derive uh, some? No, not, not yet, not yet. But I think this this might be very interesting um, uh, research direction. Okay, okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Well, now I think we can finish for today. Uh, once again, uh, thank you very much, Pavel, for accepting our invitation and give this mm -hmm. uh, this nice talk. And I hope to see you on Friday. Uh, yes, yes, uh, I'll see you on Friday. Yeah, for support. <laughs> exactly. So thank you very much, everybody. See you next time. Thank you very much for your invitation.